Today's presentation will be by Dr. Gary Dunbar. Dr. Dunbar got his PhD in psychobiology from Clark University in Massachusetts. He has taught at Central Michigan University for 24 years. He is currently professor and chairperson in the Department of Psychology. He is director of the interdisciplinary programs in neuroscience. He's director of the Brain Research and Integrative Neuroscience Center at CMU. Dr. Dunbar is a special projects editor for restorative neuro neurology and neuroscience. He's also the editor on the editorial board of the Journal of Undergraduate Neuroscience Education. Dr. Dunbar has re received several teaching awards, including Michigan Professor of the Year from the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, and also the Distinguished Faculty Member Award for the Michigan Association of Governing Boards of State Universities. He has published several chapters and several articles. His most recent research has focused on testing the efficacy of bone marrow transplants and pharmacology treatment for neuroanatomy and behavioral deficits in animal models of neurodegenerative diseases, particularly Huntington's, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's disease. His presentation today will be the experimental therapies for Huntington's disease. Dr. Dunbar. Thank you very much for that warm welcome, and uh, thank you, Rich, for the nice introduction. I'd like to thank uh, people in the uh, health professions, particularly for sponsoring this uh, wonderful series of talks, and uh, particularly Marvis Larry and Linda Stanford, and all the wonderful colleagues in the College of Health Professions. They've helped me and my colleagues in the neuroscience field very warmly welcomed uh, into the new building, uh, and as part of three colleges, including health, uh, the health professions and science technology and CHSBS, uh, uh, we were delighted to, to be near people that have similar interests and, and uh, we hope to have expand our collaborative um, workings with, through the Bridges program and other things uh, uh, with this college. And also on behalf of my colleagues in clinical psychology, uh, I think they also uh, agree that they were warmly received uh, um, by the wonderful colleagues in College of Health Professions. Most of my work in the last 10 years has focused, I'd say 90% of it, has focused on Huntington's disease. Um, why Huntington's disease? I don't have it in my family. Um, in fact, when I first came here, I, I, uh, my focus was primarily on Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, which I have aunts and uncles and second cousins that all suffer from, from these devastating neurodegenerative disorders. Um, I kind of stumbled on Huntington's as a graduate student and at Clark University. And we were doing traumatic brain injury models, and one of the models was uh, uh, damaging the neostriatum, which turns out to be the very area of the brain that's, that uh, degenerates in Huntington's disease. So I continued that interest, and more recently I had been adopted by uh, many families that are suffering from Huntington's disease in the state of Michigan. Uh, I, I met with Bob and Ruth Lettner after a televised uh, program on PBS, they, um, uh, which I was interviewed. Uh, they said, someone's doing Huntington's research right here in Michigan. And they got me connected with all of these people that it's a devastating disorder. So as I mentioned, um, I really, Started out with, this was my first lab group uh, way back when I came back to CMU. Um, and all of them were working on Alzheimer's disease. Now, Deb Clark's sitting here. She probably recognizes some of them. Uh, this is Dr. Tracy Mosier, now a physician in the Chicago area. Greg Smith. This is Dr. Rick Briscoe, who is now uh, a uh, director in the toxicology at Merck. This is Dr. Charles Weaver, who is now a uh, research scientist at uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine. This is Dr. Tom Bishop, who is a clinical psychologist. 
This is Dr. Scott Janis, who is a director at NINDS of the NIH clinical uh, trials, and Ann Coco. There are several others, um, including Dr. Larissa Mead, who uh, worked on a lot of the Alzheimer's uh, research. She's now a clinical neuropsychologist at the University of Maine, and Brad Snyder, who is a research scientist at Pfizer. Most of our work, as I mentioned, was on the area of Alzheimer's disease, but there's a lot of connection between all of these neurodegenerative diseases. They all have some genetic component. They all have some uh, what we call plaques, neurofibrillary tangles and senile plaques. These beta amyloid plaques are, are hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, but you also have Lewy bodies, alpha synuclein uh, loaded uh, Lewy bodies in Parkinson's disease, and these uh, intranuclear inclusions in Huntington's disease. They're all very similar. What else? Well, we find that use of a substance, and this is the take home message to some degree uh, of my talk, and that is nerve growth factor. This is uh, an, an endogenous chemical substance, protein which is very, very vital for survival of neurons when they're growing. And without nerve growth factor, these neurons die out. What we found is exogenous putting nerve growth factor in brain damaged animals, and particularly all of these neurodegenerative diseases, we have seen that uh, it can ameliorate some of the, the behavioral, some of the anatomical deficits that you see in all these disorders. So it isn't a big jump necessarily from Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease to Huntington's disease uh, in, in this regard. What is Huntington's disease? Well, it's a genetic disorder. If you have, if one of your parents has a gene, the mutant gene for Huntington's disease, you have a 50% chance of getting it. It's autosomal dominant. So what does it do? Well, we know it, it, it expands what we call CAG repeats uh, on the mutant Huntington. In other words, that protein is abnormally long, and it folds abnormally, and it's a targeted by these caspases. These are proteins that will cut it. And some think that the toxic fragments, parts of this, cut up uh, hunting and protein, may gum up the works of the cell, particularly transcription that, that's providing a mechanism of, of making new proteins. One thing that Huntington's also has in common with Parkinson's and with Alzheimer's disease uh, and many neurodegenerative diseases is mitochondrial dysfunction and I'll be talking about that uh, in this lecture as well. The area of the brain, the neostriatum, consists of a lot of these GABAergic, this is gamma immunobutyric acid, these uh, uh, GABAergic medium spiny neurons. These are the first to die out in the center of the brain area called the neostriatum in Huntington's patients. Um, there's a triad of symptoms. The most common one is choreic movements. It starts out with little twi twitches and pretty soon it's uncontrollable. Choreic uh, comes from choreography, the, the Greek root, dance-like. These are dance-like, almost rhythmic movements, but the person cannot stand still. Uh, and, and this is part of a basal ganglia uh, this is where the neostriatum is and part of the brain uh, disorder. You also have cognitive disorders. Sometimes these precede the choreic hallmark movements. In fact, Huntington's disease is now converted back in terms of naming in the uh, Di uh, Diagnostic Statistical Manual 3 into um, uh, Huntington's chorea, which originally was called. Um, but anyway, before these choreic movements come, come into play, sometimes 10 to 15 years beforehand, you can tap into um, some of the cognitive deficits using such things as a Wisconsin card sorting task. It measures uh, perseveration and ability, uh, cognitive flexibility. And these patients will show deficits in, in such tasks. So these cognitive deficits gets worse and worse and worse. Psychiatric symptoms such as depression is common. Uh, comorbidity is very common in, in Huntington's disease. So as the patient gets further and further along with the disease process, the brain degenerates more and more, and more cells beside the medium spiny neurons die out. 
and pretty soon the person becomes frozen, almost like a Parkinsonian patient. And, and usually they die of asphyxiation or inability to swallow their food. Um, it's a horrible situation. And there's no effective treatment even, and certainly no cure. And so uh, this is a driving force for me and, and, and many of my students and colleagues in the Brain Center. Here is an example. This half is a coronal section of a human brain. This is the area called the neostriatum. It consists of the caudate nucleus and the putamen. They work in conjunction with mediating cognitive as well as motor functioning. Look at the difference though. Here is a half section of a person with Huntington's disease. Very noticeable difference here is an area called the lateral ventricles. Very large in the human Huntington patient. Also notice that's at the expense of a shrunken striatal region. So this area is degenerating. It's losing those neurons. Also there's some loss of cortical neurons. And you can see uh, increased fissures in, in salsi indents of the cortex um, in, in, in this slide. So what have we done? Most of our work in the first part of, of uh, the last 10 years has been in finding the best models. And this has been a very arduous and, and, and uh, challenging, uh, formidable task in some cases. There is no good model for heart, Parkinson's disease, for uh, Alzheimer's disease, and not even for Huntington's disease, which has a known genetic component. So, I will go through some of the, the studies that we have done just to show you what we have played with because I, I'm going to give you two studies that we use pharmacological treatment and two studies that we've done with stem cells. Lesion models were the first ones and uh, this one is simply go in, put an electrode, you burn out that part of the brain to mimic the area that's lost. It has severe disadvantages. One, you're not just burning out the cells that are lost in Huntington's disease, you're burning out fibers of passage. So that's not a particularly good model, but as a first crude undertaking, we did get some ideas as to what might be uh, beneficial. So we have done studies with that. More recently, they've developed these neurotoxic models. Quinolinic acid is an NMDA receptor agonist, which means it helps open calcium channels. Too much calcium rushing in can kill a cell. And that may be part of the problem with Huntington's disease. The problem with this is these acute injections, which work nicely and mimic a lot of the behavioral deficits, do not mimic the progressive nature of a neurodegenerative disease, particularly Huntington's disease. So we worked hard trying to find ways in which we could have a more progressive model. More recently, We've, we've worked with 3-nitropropionic acid. This is a, an irreversible succinate dehydrogen, dehydro, <laughs> hydrogenase inhibitor. In other words, it basically poisons or it's a toxic uh, effect on the mitochondria. And the mitochondria is very, very important for producing energy of a cell. And as I mentioned earlier, this shares a lot of the dysfunction that you see in Alzheimer's and in Parkinson's. So 3-nitropropionic acid was accidentally discovered when kids and uh, children in China were chewing moldy sugar cane. And all of a sudden they developed all these correct movements. And someone thought, wow, that's just like Huntington's disease. And sure enough, in the autopsy, you could see the same neurodegeneration that you would see in Huntington. So it, it provided a nice model. And we worked very, very hard, many years, to uh, find a model where we could titrate. The nice thing about 3-nitropropionic acid as a model for Huntington's disease is it can cross the blood-brain barrier, whereas quinolinic acid you have to put through directly into the brain. And so that was some of the problems. More recently now, we've been uh, working with transgenic mouse models. Transgene means you're taking a gene from one species, putting it in another. In this case, you're taking the mutant Huntington and putting it into mice. And so we'll be talking about, a little bit about some of these models. Again, most of these use the rat and more recently, we've been working with mice because most of the uh, transgenic models are with mice. 
As I mentioned, early on we used lesion models where we just went in and burned out part of the brain. Uh, we've tried different substances. In this case, uh, it's a, uh, my former mentor, uh, Donald G. Stein, uh, Don Stein was one of the first uh, pioneers in uh, brain tissue transplant. In fact, I studied with him at Clark University primarily to do brain tissue transplants, but I ended up working with a substance called GM1 ganglioside. And this is quite interesting because we think that ganglioside's work very much like some, some of the substances I'm going to be talking about in the two pharmacological treat one of the pharmacological treatments that uh, we've been working with. And that is, it works synergistically with that nerve growth factor, that very important protein that we talked about earlier. And so we think that in, in, in some cases it can help uh, restore ATP activity, in other words, the energy that allow the, the cells to exude calcium, for instance, that rushes in. Uh, and indeed, we did find uh, uh, very good results with this, and including uh, not obviously the primary lesion, but areas around the lesion uh, with the, that were animals given the GM1 ganglioside uh, uh, were protected much better uh, than those that didn't receive it. So that was encouraging. And I should point out, in the same time we were doing this, uh, the work with the transplants were not showing up uh, extremely well because people were finding that if you go in and pull the transplants out, the animal still could, the, the, after the recovery occurred, the animal still could solve these mazes. So it probably wasn't the transplant taking, uh, taking over the lost cells that was important, but the transplant were probably releasing trophic factors, such as nerve growth factor. So uh, we felt that, that these pharmacological treatments had a lot of uh, promise. Um, one of the, my students that's uh, now at uh, Field Neuroscience Institute, Deb Shear, and other students in my lab um, spent a lot of time comparing directly acute and intrastriatal injections. These are injections right into the neostriatum of quinolinic acid and 3-nitropropionic acid. Basically, we found that you can mimic some of the early aspects of Huntington's disease with the quinolinic acid and the latter aspects with 3-nitropropionic acid. But again, these are acute injections and instant Huntington's and, and it didn't model the, the chronic progressive nature of the disease. So we looked at ways in which we could infuse it into the brain using osmotic pumps. And we did this in collaboration with Roger Albin and Terry Bazette at the University of Michigan. And what we did in this study is almost like what uh, Dr. Sandstrom is doing uh, with his microdialysis work. We took an osmotic pump, in this case, instead of taking biochemicals from the brain itself, we're putting in neurotoxins into the brain to mimic the Huntington's disease. So we have high concentration of quinolinic acid in here, and it's pressurized and, and pushed into the brain through this microdialytic fiber. This is just uh, a way in which you can deliver this transmitter into the brain. And sure enough, we got deficits. We got progressive deficits, but unfortunately, the, the, the animals develop tolerance, so over time, instead of seeing worsening of the condition, you, you see the animal tolerates it. And the only way you could uh, overcome that is to somehow have different concentrations released at different times. And we tried that. The other disadvantage is, as you can see here, it's a bulky mechanism. It's a fragile mechanism. So it does restrict the types of behavioral assays that you can do. For instance, you can't put this animal on a balance beam because if it falls off, even into a soft cushion, it could dislodge the, uh, the uh, mechanism. So uh, we decided we'll try using polymers. And what we did is we uh, did this in uh, collaboration with a uh, friend and colleague at the uh, Magdeburg University in Germany, uh, Bernard Sabel, and we found a way in which we could uh, put in quinolinic acid into these polymers, which then we could, um, using this method, we, we made the polymers, and then we could transplant them 
into the striatum of these rats. Nice thing about the polymers is once they're in there, they can slowly release over time. And again, we got good deficits, but the same problem occurred. There was tolerance to these polymers. Plus, the disadvantage of the polymers is you are causing some damage by putting the polymers into the brain itself. So, uh, one way to get around, once you put the polymers in, one way to get around um, the tolerance might be to kind of onion shape them where you have higher concentration of the quinolinic acid towards the core of the polymer and, and then over time you would have a more progressive lesion and it would, it would, it would keep uh, the deficits that you want to get in this model uh, at a level where you can look at whether the treatment long term can have an effect. Uh, but we were unable to find a way in which you can put higher concentrations in the core of the polymer. And indeed, we found better models. And we made some breakthroughs when we uh, looked at uh, chronic administration of 3-nitropropionic acid. Again, this is that uh, succinate de uh, dehydrogenase inhibitor. And what we did with this is we found that uh, you can titrate. The nice thing about it is you can inject this systemically into the animal. You don't have to do brain surgery. So again, it crosses the blood-brain barrier. So many injections, and we just increase the dosage. Now it's very precarious because this is very, very difficult to do. There's a lot of individual variability, and also there's a very little window of vulnerability here. There's, uh, too much will kill the animals. So this is a, was a very difficult thing. Uh, I hand it to Deb Shear, Ji Dong, and uh, primarily Peng Wei Yang, who worked in my lab uh, for developing a very good uh, uh, way in which you can chronically uh, deliver 3NP and show progressive neurodegeneration and show an increase. And you'll see in the next study that we were able to get prolonged and sustained deficits. Here is a normal striatum in an animal. Um, here is a striatum at two weeks after 3NP injections. And you can see the lesions right here. At four weeks, you can see the lesion is larger and almost the entire striatum by six weeks um, has been damaged. And again, um, we were able to, to, to get a sustained model here so we could try some, some treatments. And one obvious treatment was use of creatine. Creatine actually is a fuel for the mitochondria. So if you have mitochondrial damage, and that's exactly what the 3MP is doing, if you can overcome it by providing some resource such as creatine, and we put 1% dietary creatine in, in the rat chow, animals eat the creatine, and um, <coughs> we found that we could reduce, and this is what Flint Beal had found previous to, to our work and, and really uh, had us uh, excited about trying the creatine. Here's the 3NP without the creatine. Here's 3NP with creatine. 80% reduction in the lesion. And it's not just in one section. Uh, focus on this graph. You can see at all levels from anterior, this is a bregma point, this is a, a point in the brain, anterior to posterior. Here, here is uh, the reduction by the creatine. Here is animals that did not get the creatine. So uh, we did replicate Flint Beal's work in terms of um, uh, lesion reduction. But what was very exciting to us was the behavioral assays that we had. No one had done this before. And we had a whole battery of assays. And I'm going to focus in on the balance beam. This animal here, I don't know if you can see it, uh, but there's a line, dark line here. When the, the foot slips below the line, we call that a foot slip. And we, we measure the time it takes them to transverse across the um, balance beam and the number of foot slips. We also use cognitive tests. And for those of you that are concerned about writing across the curriculum, it's not just multiple choice tests. We do use essays afterwards. And yes, our animals study very, very hard. 
uh, for, for, these, for these tests. Actually, we did construct our own maze. We took an animal feeding tank and we immersed what we call a radial arm maze into a water tank, which people use what they call a Morris water maze to find hidden platforms. The nice thing about this is it allowed us to tap into two types of memory. Reference memory, which is roughly analogous to long-term memory, and working memory, which is roughly analogous to short-term memory. And so we devised this tank where they have eight platforms, and we usually had one, two, five, and seven. Those were ones that always contained raised platforms. The other ones never contained raised platforms. And so uh, what do we mean by raised platforms? This is a diagram, eight channels. We had telescopic platforms. And so it, it's a simple matter of we had a, 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 a monofilament nylon string that draped over, that kept the platforms up. We just release it. The weighted top of the platform made the platform telescopically collapse. And so uh, we could run the animals in this maze, and I'll, I'll show you how we did it, uh, hopefully. And I'll show you what happens here. This is an animal, and I'll, I won't step, step in front. I'll use this cursor. I think you can find it. You might want to double click on this if you're in the te uh, uh, telecast uh, to get a better view of it. This animal is a quinolinic acid lesioned animal. It found the first platform just fine, so there's, there was no errors. It found platform seven, this is position seven, uh, which contained a platform, so it's, it's so far errorless. Now the platform will drop, now he has to find the remaining two, platform five and platform two. Now he's made a, a, a reference memory error, a long-term memory error. This channel never contains a platform. This is a working memory error. Anytime you return to a channel you've already visited within a session, that's like a short-term memory error, a working memory error. He was in this one, that's a second working memory error. Uh, he is going into uh, a, plat uh, a channel that never contained, but once, once they, you, you can only make four, four what we call reference memory errors, and then they, they become working memory errors. You can divide them up between working correct and working incorrect, but for our purposes, we just talk about, uh, now he has found the third platform, so that's a correct response. He has one more platform to find, but a lot of times these animals uh, a, a normal animal, that, that wasn't it, it's, it's over here. Um, this is position four, that was a reference memory error. Here, this is another working memory error, another working memory error. Now your normal animal will find within, this is five days after, um, uh, five days of training, this is the fifth day, your normal animal will do this errorlessly, one, uh, maybe on the outside, two errors uh, maximum, but uh, obviously this animal had a very difficult time finding it. So here's what we find. If you look at this, you can see that here is the animals that had just the quinolinic acid. I'm sorry, this is 3NP. The, mo the, mo the, the, the model I used was quinolinic acid, but it's the same sort of problem you see here. Um, if, as you can see, there's, there's a fairly straight deficit here with the animals that had 3MP alone. But look at what happened with the animals that got the creatine. Almost to normal levels after a while. Uh, that was very, very encouraging. The balance beam, number of completed trials, here's 3MP animals, uh, were significantly impaired relative to the controls and relative to the 3MP animals that didn't, or that did get the creatine. The same thing with the number of foot slips. More foot slips for 3MP, a significant decrease in the number of foot slips for those that got creatine, and not quite to the control levels, however. So this was very, very encouraging to us. In fact, this is, uh, other than GM1 ganglicides that I talked about before, this is the second substance I tried in preclinical trials that has gone to clinic. And in fact, they've done this in Huntington's patients at first, they had very meager results. Uh, and they tried it again more recently with higher doses. 
and sure enough, they found that it did work quite effectively. Uh, so um, it did retard the progression of the disease, uh, and it didn't revert it, of course, but uh, it's the first, I think, sign of, 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 of something that, that actually can uh, retard the progression. More recently, we worked um, with a substance from Kroninsky Pharmaceutical Companies. These are called, uh, a whole group of substances, in fact, we work with. These are substituted pyrimidines. This one is KP544. And what, uh, what, what's nice about this drug is it does cross the blood-brain barrier very effectively. Um, it does actually, in, in cell cultures, increase the efficacy of PC12 cells. These are uh, 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 cancerous type cells that can produce um, acetylcholine. And it will, it will augment the production of these neurotransmitters by fourfold. In other words, more than nerve growth factor it will itself. In other words, it's an amplifier of nerve growth factor. So why don't we just put nerve growth factor in the brain? It's a big sticky molecule. It cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. But what about a drug that will amplify or enhance the effects of endogenous neurotrophic factors, such as NGF? This drug shows promise for that in vitro. And we tried it. Uh, we were the first to try it in our animal models. And we had astoundingly good results. These animals, um, in all doses that we showed, but particularly the highest dose, this was almost control levels. We have not seen that. Uh, again, this was an acute injection of quinolinic acid. We have tried in other models, and I'll, 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 I'll allude to that in a second. Um, but particularly, as you can see in the reference memory errors, we had uh, very good effects with this drug. And when we looked at the lesion size, again, anterior to posterior into the brain, we saw in many of the sections, uh, particularly the high dose, we saw a, a significant uh, uh, reduction in the lesion size, lesion areas in, in these uh, respective uh, uh, sections. More recently, Rebecca Myers and, and other students in my lab, this is Rebecca's, part of Rebecca's thesis, um, looked at KP544 in a mouse model using 3-nitropropionic acid, 3-MP mouse model of Huntington's disease. And this is an example of a rotor rod. It's like log rolling contest. The animal's sitting on there and has to, now a normal animal doesn't have a lot of problems with this if the speed is, is not too fast. Um, but an uh, animal that uh, has 3-nitropropionic acid starts slipping and will fall into the the soft cushion underneath, they don't know it's a soft cushion, but uh, they're motivated to stay on, usually. And uh, uh, so uh, what Rebecca found was, as you can see, here is the 3MP treated animals. You see, significant reduction in the time they can stay on that rotor rod. Look what the KP544 did. Significantly uh, um, reduced, and more importantly, if you look at longevity, those animals that received the KP544 live longer. So this was very encouraging to us. So we tried it on the transgenic mouse model. This is an R62 transgenic mouse model. It has the human gene in it. Uh, one of the characteristic uh, Signs of having the Huntington gene is what we call clasping. Normally, if you hold an animal by the tail, it will splay out its arms. These animals clasp, so, so uh, it gives us one clue that they have the gene. And Dr. Ming Lu, who is my research associate, helps me <laughs> by taking tail clips and, and doing PCR to genotype them to make sure that they do have the uh, Huntington gene. Uh, Nick Day, my, another graduate student of mine, um, and several people in the lab have been working on a project uh, looking at these uh, KP544 treatments in these transgenic mouse models. Here's another behavioral assay that we use. This is just an open field apparatus. We have 
infrared beams that cross through here, and so we can map the movement of this animal uh, over 12 hours or more if we want. And what uh, we found is quite, again, quite striking. Uh, here's animals that just had uh, the gene, the, the R62 animals without any treatment. This is transgenic mice. And you can see here the animals that, got the, uh, that has the gene but has the treatment were near normal levels again. So again, this is encouraging. However, we didn't find a lot of significance in our cognitive tasks uh, and some of the other motor tasks were, were disappointing. Uh, this may be due to the inadequacies of the model itself. Transgenic model is not Huntington's disease. And here's one of the reasons why. You're taking a transgene, you're putting the human mutant Huntington into a mouse. The mouse already has two alleles, two, two perfectly good genes uh, that produce their Huntington protein. So they have more of the good Huntington protein uh, than a, a person that has uh, uh, a gene. That may be important. How much of the good Huntington do you have to have? We know if you don't have it, if you don't have any of it, uh, certainly during development you will die. So it's, it's critical. But they're using these what we call short interfering RNAs. These are things that will block the production of Huntington protein. Unfortunately it will block both the mutant and the normal Huntington. But if you can knock it down enough to where you have enough of the good Huntington to, 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 to carry on the housekeeping uh, chores of a, of a cell, with a, and, but, but keep the mutant Huntington under control, that might be an effective treatment. And they're looking at that. Beverly Davidson and uh, Henry Paulson at the University of Iowa uh, are doing work in that. The last thing I want to talk about is our work with stem cells. And we're focusing more and more on that, not because we think that the stem cells themselves are going to take the place of neurons. Obviously, that would be wonderful. That would be a long-term goal. And people are working very hard in all sorts of models of diseases to do that. But we think that these cells can be good vectors, or these cells can be good conduits for producing those typotrophic factors that, that are needed particularly nerve growth factor, or in Huntington's, another very important trophic factor called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. As you can see, what distinguishes a stem cell is it's relatively undifferentiated. It will go down a certain lineage, but you have, depending on the chemical milieu or the environment you put this, these cells in, if you put it in the brain, for instance, these bone marrow stem cells in the brain, hopefully they will take on neuronal phenotypes. And that's what we try to do. Um, the idea here is, and we did this in our animals, we simply load up the stem cells and put them into the striatum. We are trying some, and I'll point out that at the end, uh, the students in my lab are working on some pilot work looking at other ways to deliver stem cells such as IV, IP, uh, but this we put directly into the brain. And this project I did with colleague of mine, Laurent Lescadron, in, in Nantes, France, and we, were, we took autologous stem cells. What does that mean? Well, the idea here is a human could use their own stem cells, reduce the, the, the chance of rejection. So you could take from the, the, the hip, you could uh, remove the stem cells, the bone marrow stem cells, and, and transplant them into the brain. Of course, there's a problem here when you talk about Huntington's disease, and what's that problem? All these cells have the mutant Huntington. But if it takes, on average, it does take about 42 years, a range of from two years to 82 years before the symptoms emerge. But, but by far, the, it's a steep curve. And around 42, that median age, that's where it kicks in. If it takes another 42 years for it to kick in, you're probably pretty safe at using it if there's a problem with rejection. And we don't know that. Um, but we did find, again, with the clonic acid model, we did find that these um, uh, whole bone marrow stem cells that we put in the brains of our clonic acid treated rats did alleviate some of the learning deficits. Uh, we didn't see much with the motor deficits, however. 
But what was encouraging to us, here's the transplant at seven days, here's the transplant at 42 days. It, it was still viable uh, after six weeks. Uh, of, uh, we also could see that we, these were nestin positive. Nestin is an is a antibody that, that uh, codes, you can see these cells, these are, 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 are labeled cells uh, that allow us to see which, that they were transplanted cells, and they cola uh, labeled, in this case, with nestin, which is a neuronal phenotype. It doesn't mean it's a neuron, but it means it's taking on the course uh, lineage of what neurons would take on. Also, another uh, antibody, beta tubulin, which usually uh, suggests that it's taking on neuronal phenotypes, uh, was labeled here. And, and interestingly enough, we had very few of these, but we did find some of them uh, labeled for GAD. Now, this is, this is a marker for these GABAergic neurons that die out in Huntington's disease. So there may be some chance of replacement, but there's less than 0.1% of these neurons <laughs> labeled for GAD. So that certainly wasn't the causative agent of this uh, recovery that we saw. What was also encouraging, however, is using cytochrome oxidase stain. This shows the integrity of the metabolic activity of a cell. In other words, these cells are viable after 42 days. And so we feel that stem cells do have a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, potential, but we're not convinced that we're at the point right now where they're gonna be taking over the, the, the cells that are lost. They, we feel that they're probably producing nerve growth factor or neurotrophic factor, such as brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which will allow the rest of the, the intact brain to function more, more readily. Uh, finally, we looked at, uh, in, in conjunction with my colleague Justin O'Lee, uh, at uh, whether or not autologous stem cells, those that come from the same host, versus heterologous, those that come from different mice, or rats in this case, uh, would work as effectively. And that's an important question because we want to make sure that they're as efficacious uh, and there's no rejection. And what we did find, however, is, as you can see here, relative to those that got the heterologous transplant, the autologous transplant tended to do better. Uh, we did see some gliosis in both cases, nothing definitive that, that uh, 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 yet, but it does suggest that perhaps we have to be wary about what kind of stem cells we utilize. There may be a chance of, of rejection long term if you're using heterologous versus autologous. We, still, we, we have to look at that closely, um, and it's one of the things that we'd like to do. In summary, we found that creatine, we also found that coenzyme Q10 that we're, we're writing up now can attenuate striatal atrophy and reduce cognitive motor deficits in the 3NP model of Huntington's disease. Also, uh, these substituted pyrimidines can reduce some of the cognitive deficits and motor deficits in the QA model of Huntington's disease and reduce some of the motor deficits in, in both the 3NP and the transgenic mouse model of Huntington's disease. Autologous transplants of bone marrow derived cells can reduce cognitive deficits in the QA model of HD. We don't know uh, to what extent heterologous cells uh, yet uh, work in our behavioral assays. In the future, oh, not the future, we're doing it now. We, in fact, just last week, we transplanted some of our mice with these uh, stem cells with green fluorescent protein. What's green fluorescent protein? This is, you know how jellyfish glow in the dark? This is a transgenic mouse that has that gene that produces the green fluorescent protein. This mouse, put them in the right light, glows all the cells of the body. What's nice about that is you can use those stromal stem cells um, and trace them as they go through the brain. So that's what we're gonna be doing. Uh, that's what we're doing now. We're looking at different routes of administration, intraperitoneally or intravenously. We're looking at the efficacy of genetically engineering. Ming Lu is, is working on this, where he's, he's changed these stem cells to, to overexpress brain-derived neurotrophic factor or nerve growth factor to see whether or not that will enhance our efficacy. And finally, we want to look at whether KP544 uh, in different models 
uh, is efficacious. And, and, and indeed, even uh, in conjunction with perhaps some of these stem cell transplants. In the future, we want to do, uh, I want to continue collaborating with Michael Sandstrom, who's been a wonderful collaborator on a lot of these projects. And uh, he's an uh, expert in biochemical assays. Uh, John Kelty is interested in doing some electrophysiology of these stem cells. Mark Riley uh, is a behaviorist that wants to look at impulsivity. Um, we have uh, Ming Lu is, whoops, excuse me, is going to be working on um, these genetically engineered stem cells. Deb Shear is interested in a project where we we'll look at embryonic stem cells versus adult stem cells and their efficacy. And Rick Bax uh, is interested in, in doing cognitive workloads in Huntington's patients. And recently I've talked to uh, Don Nelson and Deb Silkwood Chair, who are interested in uh, balance deficits in Huntington's patients. I want to acknowledge my wonderful students over the years. Christy Haig Martinez, uh, who is now Associate Professor, Dr. Martinez, now Associate Professor at University of North Carol uh, Nor Northern Kentucky. Ji Dong, Dr. Ji Dong, who is a physician in the Flint area, uh, Dr. Peng Wei Yang, who is a research scientist at, uh, in the pharmaceutical division of Johnson & Johnson. Tim Gates, who is finishing up his uh, starting his residency. Uh, Divya Uni, who is at the, a doctoral student at the University of Albany, SUNY Albany. Uh, Crystal Simpson, who is a uh, bench student at uh, Wayne State. Jacob McLean, who is at Michigan State. Rebecca Myers, who is here. Lene York, who is here. Justin O'Lee, uh, who is here. Ming. Lou Debshear, who is uh, finishing up her PhD with me, and that's uh, uh, Farzad Mordazavi, who just uh, successfully uh, defended his orals at Northeastern University. James Copridge, Dr. James Copridge, who is working with Ole uh, Isaacson at Harvard. Brady Peterson just took a job at PA in, uh, in uh, up, up the Upper Peninsula. Uh, Michelle Maisie. Michelle Maisie is, uh, uh, finished her doctorate at Vanderbilt University. She was, uh, Deb Shear was, got first N NSF awardee here, and also was a, a runner up for a national honor uh, for the fact of undergraduate neuroscience uh, top researcher. Michelle Maisie was the top researcher when uh, her senior year. Rob DeCourt, who is in, in law school, Nick Day, who is here, Angela Gorson here, and Laurent, and Michael Sandstrom, and Bernard Sobel in Germany. And also, my wonderful lab that uh, um, had been stuck by me uh, over the years, uh, Tiffany Holloway, who is in uh, Florida State, Andrew Burkhart, Sarah Johnson, Lene York, Rebecca Myers, Andrea Sommer, Nick Day, Tom Bassis, Angela Borson, Ming Lu, I don't know, um, Mike Sandstrom, Ben Van Gilder, and um, Matt Bombard. And also, my, uh, those that, that supported this, this research, NASA Science Foundation, NIH, Fiddy Pharmaceutical, Kroninsky, Field Neuroscience Institute, my friend and colleague, Bern Halls, and particularly, uh, who I think is a saint, uh, Malcolm Fields, and of course, John G. Cajaldi uh, for endowing uh, the professorship in the neuroscience, and all of my friends and uh, colleagues at CMU. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary, for this presentation. It's uh, obviously, you've been a mentor for many students that have gone on to some very prestigious universities and uh, professional um, jobs. Uh, this now is open for uh, questions. Those watching on the web uh, can submit questions by clicking on the Ask button that is located just above the video window. Open for questions. Dr. Betts. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm interested in the clinical studies that were follow-ups of your work with the creatine 3NP. Was, um, was that done in Huntington patients across all stages of their disease, or were there you know, uh, select groups of patients who, for whom that was of benefit in retarding the progression? Do you know from That's that follow-up work? 
That's a very good question, Elaine. I, I, I would say that it probably, uh, there's, there's not enough of these Huntington patients to have a very restrictive uh, different phase. They try to, to keep them uh, in, in, in certain phases, phase one, phase two, phase three of the, the disease progress, and usually uh, these are, are symptomatic, but they, they have different studies uh, at different stages. Uh, um, and this one, I believe it was at least stage two, and, uh, uh, and so they, they have a rating scale, and it's a double-blind study. And uh, at first, they didn't see much uh, difference, and, and, and when they upped the dose and tried it again, they, they saw that those that got the creatine, um, their scores remained fairly constant, where those that didn't get the creatine uh, tended to get, get worse over time. Mm -hmm. While we're waiting, Gary, I have one for you. Uh, the treatments that require uh, passing the blood-brain barrier, do they pass that barrier at different levels? And if so, how do you get optimal treatment based very, on that? Very good question. Um, there, there are all sorts of, uh, in fact, dendromers is, is, is one uh, new way in which they're trying to deliver certain drugs. These drugs that are efficacious in Huntington's may be a little bit large uh, at this point in time, but uh, who knows. Uh, there are also anti-cancer drugs that open, make the blood-brain barrier a little bit more leaky that allow some of these drugs to cross through. Uh, the nice thing about the pyrimidines is we do see that they get in uh, very readily, even more so than what we saw with the GM1 ganglicides, uh, uh, as far as I, I know. So yeah, there's, there's, some, there's some concern about that, particularly if you could get exogenous nerve growth factor through the blood-brain barrier, it might be uh, even more efficacious than the secondary indirect approaches that we've been using. Gary, is the, is the ultimate agenda to identify a means whereby someone could, who, who had this genetic predisposition could start a therapy early in life and the 42-year average onset would be pushed back more and more and more? Is, is that where we're heading? A absolutely. And in, in fact, you know, I've always looked at it as kind of a two-prong attack. The stem cells, I always thought, this is probably, for those that have the disease, uh, a chance to, to restore some of the progress. Um, with the substance pyrimidines and others, the nice thing about Huntington's is, is, is you can, there's a 99.99% accuracy in terms of the genetic testing. You will know if you have the disease. And if you have a prophylactic drug that will uh, prevent the re, uh, retard the progression of the disease, you've got something. And, and so you can start the treatment early. And that, and in fact, all of these uh, pharmacological treatments I use, I, I use that in mind. And I pre-treat the animals before we give them the, uh, the gene. Uh, obviously, with a transgenic mice, um, that, that we try to get them uh, earlier. But that's, that, is, that is the goal, absolutely. Do you think we are to that point? Wow. We, Creatine was about the only thing we've seen so far. I mean, uh, they are talking about using these subsuperimidines in clinical trials, um, but they need more. They need more studies with it. I mean, uh, I was very, very, uh, uh, I think, excited about our, our initial results. But when we looked at the the uh, transgenic mice, uh, I want to try them on, on on other mice too. We have one question here from a web participant. How does the green fluorescence protein help research of Huntington's disease? It helps us track, it helps us track the, the, where the stem cells are going. In other words, uh, and, and whether, whether they're viable. They're, they're a nice marker. They're not infallible, but they're a better marker than, than some of the other things that we use. Uh, so when we put green fluorescent protein bone marrow derived stem cells into the brain, we can see where those migrate, whether or not they're healthy and, and the transplants are viable over a long period of time. So there, it's a really good uh, tool for us to use. Okay, we have uh, time for one more question. Gary, um, did, when, when you were doing the creatine studies, did you look at carnitine or carnitine, acetylated carnitine? No. As, as a potential compound? No, uh, that was when I had the $3,500 startup, and I didn't, <laughs> didn't have much uh, biochemical assays to work with. Uh, but but uh, 
that's an obvious one. Uh, and and uh, I, I think Flint Beale has subsequently done that, so, so it's a good question because uh, um, this was, uh, um, we did, uh, uh, we were early on in, in, in looking at the behavioral assays uh, and uh, we weren't really equipped at that point in time to, to do some of the biochemical. Now with, with this wonderful facility and with good colleagues like uh, Michael Sandstrom who does a lot of biochemical, we can, we can uh, approach some of these things. Dr. Dunbar, thank you very much for your okay. presentation. Well, thank you, Rick. <laughs>